Well, good afternoon again. Uh, we greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We just thank you for joining us in our Thursday Bible study. Uh, thank you for being so considerate on last week when I had to leave them, but I'm a chaplain at a hospice house in Landrum, and there was a need for me to be there, so I had to cut my Bible study short so I could go to the hospice house and be with the family who uh, had was experiencing the death of a loved one. So duty calls, and I thank you for being understanding that we did cut our Bible study short uh, because of those reasons, but that's what we're here. We're here to serve. So we just thank God for another day. Thank God for another opportunity to study his word. Thank God for all the blessings that he has bestowed upon us up to this moment in time in life. Uh, God is good. I, I just I just want to say that God is good. He, he has blessed us tremendously in this life. And uh, I simply want to bless him back. That should be all of our desire if we look at our life and look at how much God has blessed us. We should simply want to bless him back. I enjoy... I've been working in my yard today. I'm, uh, you know, um, 60, almost 68 years old, and I still cut my grass with a push mower and weed eat and everything. So I'm grateful to God that I'm able to do those things. And they small things, but they mean a lot to me uh, that God has granted me through all the, the grace and mercy through all I've been through in this life to still be able to be closed in my right mind and have a reasonable portion of life, health, and strength, and able to do some things, and and I don't take any of it for granted. I only know, I know it's a, only by God's grace and mercy. So let's pray, and then we'll get started in our Bible study. We're going to uh, continue to talk about five stages of transformation, five stages of transformation on this Christ journey, on this Christ journey. Uh, notice I didn't say Christian journey, but Christ journey. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for every blessing. God, we thank you for all that you have brought to our life. God, you have brought so much. But God, the most important thing you brought was salvation through your son, Jesus. Then God, we you indwelled us with the Holy Spirit, God, and we are so grateful and we're so humble that you loved us enough that you would send your son to die for us, God. And we just, we just so Thankful for your love, your unending love. So, God, we simply now desire to submit ourselves to you once again today. God, use us as you see fit. Give us wisdom, insight, and knowledge as we rightly divide the word of God. God, is always our aim to please you and to encourage someone to, uh, to follow and walk with you. For us in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, hey darling. Well, our base scripture for today. Hey, Sister Thomasina, always grateful that you could tune in with us. So, we're going to pick up, and I'm going to do some review from last week, Ben, that I had to leave so early, I cut it so short last week. So, our base scripture is found in Romans chapter 12, very familiar passage of scripture, Romans chapter 12. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. It says, and I'm reading out the New Open Bible. The New Open Bible is what I'm reading out of today. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that is what you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Hey, Sister Far, Fair, I'm sorry. Hey, Sister Fair, thank you for tuning in. So we're talking about transformation. All of us should be growing in God. So I'm going to talk about five things that Five stages of transformation on this Christ journey. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to grow. He wants us to develop into 
be more like him. Again, we're not talking about becoming holier than thou, but we're, we're talking about becoming disciples, becoming stronger in our walk with God, more assured of the promises that God has provided for us and how those promises can be manifested in our life as we walk on this Christ journey, as we walk with Christ. Uh, that's what it's all about. It's all about growing. It's all about developing. It's all about becoming mature in the word of God and how to apply it to fight the attacks of the devil and, and, and even deal with people and how, how we deal with situations and circumstances as we go through this life. Uh, because this journey is all about transformation. It's about growing. So Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. He writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He said, And we all, who with us unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, as the veil is being lifted off of our face, we begin to see the glory of God uh, more and more in our lives and on our lives and in our walk. We're being transformed, it says, into his image, into his image with increasing glory. Look, all of the glory belongs to God. All the glory belongs to God. But there is there can be glory on your life, which comes from the Lord, who is spirit. It comes from the Lord. I, I want to walk in a life that the glory of God shines through. I don't know about you, but I, I want people to know without a cross around my neck, a Bible under my arm, uh, but they just know uh, that the glory of God rests upon me because of that aura it gives off when they see me. Uh, Paul talks about being transformed into the very image of Christ with increasing glory. To me, that's exciting. That I didn't just uh, come out of uh, I didn't just come out of the world of sin, but I'm still growing in the things of God. I, I would hate to just being saved and that was the end of it, but I'm increasing in the glory of God. I'm being transformed into the glory of God. It's sort of like uh, we know about uh, a butterfly and uh, well, a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. With metamorphosis, you know, I want to be that great. I want to be transformed into that great butterfly of God that people can see the beauty of God. Uh, see, and that's that metamorphosis is a process of transformation. That's a process of transformation that we go through. And that's what we want to talk about on this Christian journey, about those five stages. Here are some stages. And... and People may may want to may contemplate or differ with me how I got the stages lined up, but I believe that uh, this is the way God gave it to me. So I want to give it to you to be moved toward a, a, a mature Christian. See, the first stage I got, and we talked about this a little bit last week, is repentance. Repentance. We have to repent. We have to make a bow face, a complete change in our direction to begin to live a Christian life or begin to embrace this Christ journey. Uh, we got to turn away from self-serving ventures and focus our love and our energy on the kingdom of God and bringing glory to God. Uh, see, life has a way. Life experiences have a way of pushing us toward God. Uh, I don't know about you. When I look back over my life now, I come to understand there are some situations and circumstances that nobody but God, nobody but God brought me through, brought me around, brought me over. Nobody but God and his grace and mercy was, his hand was on me that I survived some situations in my life. But it started with me having a repentive heart, turning from self-serving things and start uh, having a heart for God. And, and that's what we are, we got to have. We got to have that heart for God. But repentance is important. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, we, we got to understand that repentance is a, 
the Bible tells us that we need to repent. Uh, see, and, and, and this change, sometimes it's a process. It's a process in that change, and once we repent, it's a process that God began to work in our lives, and we began to learn lessons, and, and, and we began to move toward things uh, of God and move into uh, praising and worshiping God and giving God all the praise and honor and glory for being in our lives. But repentance is it, it, it's something that we have to work at. We have to be mindful of. Second Peter 3 and 9. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any man should perish, that all should come to repentance. See, God is God has been patient with us. Hey, brother Brandon Green, God has been patient with us. He's He's long long suffering with us, and He's not slack concerning His promises. The more we move toward God, the more we begin to see the things of God begin to activate or be manifested in our life. You know, back in the day, they used to sing a song in the church: "If you make one step." God will make two. See, sometimes we talk about that step of making it, making it out of a, a, a situation. But I'll come to tell you, when you walk, when you make one step toward God, he'll make two steps towards you, what I'm talking about. You make one step, he'll make two steps towards you. God is willing to meet you right where you are. And, but we got to have that repentive heart. That's what I like about it. If you make one step, he'll make two. He he will meet you right where you are. He'll meet you in your situation and he'll love on you. And he'll love he'll love on you and love you through your situation. But we gotta have that repentive heart to be received, to receive that that love of God and begin to develop that relationship with God. Acts chapter three, Acts chapter three, verse nineteen. It said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. See, we got to repent so we can be converted, that we can move away from those uh, those sinful ways and sinful thoughts and sinful actions. We have to make that turn. And, 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 and I like that when it says, your sins will be blotted out. You know, that's what I like about God. You know, we, we've done all done some things in our life, but God is not like man, that he try to hold things over our life. You know, he, he he's not like, like man to try to hold things over our life. Once we repent and, and, and begin and start that conversion process, walking in that relationship with God and begin to develop that life in Christ, you know, then it says, when the time of refreshing shall come, from the presence of the Lord. You know, it's the it's the presence of the Lord in our life that bring that freshness, that new, that open our eyes and, and open our heart and to receive uh, all that God has for us and begin to walk in all that God has for us. Uh, you know, that, that's, the, that's the importance of repentance is, is that, yeah, yeah, Brother Green, we begin to be sanctified, set aside, for dedicate our life for God. So the first stage for me in transformation is repentance. Turning our heart, our focus, and our purpose to God. Turning our lives, submitting ourselves to God. So it's holy. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Letting God. Then the second stage, after repent, after a repentance take place, uh, justification. Justification is that next stage. And another word for justification is redemption. It's redemption. Uh, we've been redeemed. We realize that it's only by the grace and the mercy of God that we overcame the, the, the clutch of the devil. And now we are we, we're walking in the freeness and the newness of God. We've been redeemed. We've been pardoned. It is an act of grace on God's part. Uh, nothing that we done it, 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 it we is just an act of grace and mercy and love on God's part that He redeemed us through His Son Jesus. 
and, and that's it. That, I love that. About, uh, not that he justified my sin, but this is what we need to get. He didn't justify our sin. He justified us that we can walk in the newness of our life. You know, he, he never justified our sin. He just freed us from the condemnation. Now he gives us that justification to walk in the newness in him of him. That's where that justification is, that the old man is now dead. I, 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 I'm justified to begin. Yeah, I'm a new creation in Christ. And I'm justified to stand in God because I've been redeemed. I've been bought with the price. Uh, the old is passed away. Uh, all things have become new in my life. That, that's, that's the justification I'm talking about. See, justification brings us to Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, 38 through 40. When it says, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their heart that they may not turn from me. Listen what I'm talking about. Listen. Hey, now, Brother Giss, listen what I'm talking about when it says, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I give them one heart, one way, that they may fear me. That fear is not that I, I'm not fearing that God's just waiting to strike me down. But I have an awe of God. I, and, 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 and all that I have seen God do in my life, and all that I've seen God bring me out of, and all the love that God has embraced me with, I have an awe that, of God that... Uh, that I never want to disappoint him. That's what he's talking I never want to disappoint him. Now, God is a God of wrath. Don't get me wrong. God do get angry, but he's slow to anger. Now, God do get angry. Uh, see, that's the thing about it. People really don't fear God in the fact that they think he's so grace and merciful that we don't never anger God. But thank God that he's slow to anger, and even in his anger, he is still merciful. Woo! He's still merciful. He's still patient with us. Cause, cause, it, cause, and he's not out to destroy us. Now, sometimes he has to discipline us, as 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 our father, as Abba. Am I right? But but God also, he, he you know, we we don't fear the Lord in that way because. Well, he's too gracious to do this. He's too gracious to do that. Uh, but if we, if we was to just think about, let me put it this way. When our parents told us, our mother, earthly mother and father told us not to do certain things, we did them anyway. Or if your mother told you, wait till your daddy get home, you were over in a corner shivering, uh, when your dad began to approach you, you hear his car coming. You begin, you I mean, you begin to cry before he even get in the house. Am I right? So if we had that much fear for our earthly father of his discipline, why don't we have that for our Creator, who created the heaven and earth, who is all powerful, all sovereign? Can are, are y'all feel what I'm saying? How, when is the last time? That you really had a repentant or tearful heart because you know you let God down. You know you went against the things that God did not want you to do. See, we don't, we, we think that God is so merciful that we just do whatever we want to do. He's going to automatically forgive us. Yes, He will forgive us, but sometimes He have to discipline us. Come on and talk to me. If we, if we, could fear our earthly father, why can't we have a fear of our heavenly father about disappointing him and making him anger and, and warn off his discipline? Yeah, God will discipline us. Yes. And I tell you what, I'll take a whooping from my earthly daddy over a whooping from God. Woo! 
Yeah, somebody will get that. But but listen, that's when we when we really begin to walk in tune with God and have that awe of God uh, and have that relationship with God it, because we're in a, a covenant relationship with God. And in that covenant relationship, we always see it as a uh, privilege to serve God. And we never want to abuse that privilege. See, we, sometimes we want to take advantage of God because we, we, we're, we, we know we're justified. We think we have justification. But it's talking about justification is a stage of growing. We talked about redemption. We talked about justification. But justification is all about growing. And it's all about what God does for us not what we do for him. But it's a, when we think about what God is doing for us, then we grow up. It's a growing stage. Uh, see, it's, it's a stage where we begin to see how much self-worth we have. Okay? Self-worth we have. Listen, we begin to understand our identity is now in Christ and it's not about us. And there's nothing we need to prove. Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. And even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Since the works of the law, uh, no flesh will be justified. See, see, we, you know, it's about having that faith, having that relationship, walking into that new life with God, knowing that God can create in me, create in you a clean heart and renew the right spirit in you. It's walking in that relationship and with faith, with faith. And, and, and we don't have to run around trying to uh, uh, convince other people that we're that way. Because we, God will begin to show up in our life. Justification is, is when God pardons us as an act. So after we after we go through repentance and we, we a justification, we go through what we call a rebirth, a rebirth stage. Uh, brother uh, Brother Green says glorification, but a rebirth. We repent. God justifies. He pardons our sin. We rebirth. What am I talking about? Being born again. Being born again is about finding that new identity in Christ. We're not just forgiven. We're being incorporated into a much larger body. We're being encompassed by the Holy Spirit. We're being encompassed. It's a much larger body. We become less concerned about ourselves and more concerned about the kingdom of God. Remember, I did a teaching on kingdom mindset, and that's where we got to get. We got to begin to have a kingdom mindset, and that kingdom mindset is not that I just made it, but I want to see everyone make it. What Jesus said, I came not to I came not to be served, but I came to serve. See, we got to have that rebirth, that born again. We are incorporated into a larger body. We become, as Peter put it, in First Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. It says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. For by these he hath granted us his precious and magnificent promise, so that by them you may become, part you may become partakers of of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. See, it, it, again, it's God is giving. It's us receiving. And it's allowing us to take on a life of a divine nature, which, which is impossible without Christ. Which is impossible without Christ. Okay? As we begin... And it's a it's a dramatic shift in our life. And as we begin to take our own 
identity in Christ, we naturally feel better about who we are. We may even wake up with a sense of purpose. Sometimes this can be a difficult transition because self-interest is always in our life. But we have to understand self-interest was consumed in the resurrection of Christ. It's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? It's not only, it's not that I live, but it's the Christ that lives in me. Okay. Uh, it's about a big leap of faith, trusting that new life always follow death. You got to get this part. It's a big leap of faith, trusting that a new life always follows death. That means something have to die in our life for the new to begin. If we want the newness of Christ, we want that transformation in God, then we have to learn to die to self, die to the flesh, die to old habits, die to old attitudes. And then we have to move into the newness of God. But some things must die in our life. Hey, Sister Doris, we glad you were able to join. But we have to, stuff must die in order for the newness to take place. Look, every winter, every winter, the leaves die, flowers die. But soon as springtime comes, soon as springtime comes, it lives again. And it's something, one thing I've learned, because I like to garden, I like to work in my yard, but when you... When you, uh, when you prune and let stuff die naturally, look, when it comes back, it comes back even more beautiful than it was before. And that's what I'm talking about. God wants us to live a beautiful life, but it's about the rebirth. It's about being born again. It's about submitting to God. It's about repenting. It's about embracing transformation. It's about, uh, it's about the, embracing the love of God. It's about embracing the newness uh, that God uh, uh, that God brings to our life, and it's about finding your place in the body, finding our place in the body of Christ, and, and we will be guided by the Holy Spirit. We will be guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, It'll be guided by God's presence in our life. It'll guide us into a deeper relationship. It'll guide us into telling other people about what God has done for you. It's a deeper relationship with developed results. That means that you can tell people, if God did it for me, he can do it for you. This rebirth is a work of God and can be sure of his lasting effect. It's going to have a lasting effect. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And I am sure of this, that he who had begun a good work in you will bring it unto completion at that day of Jesus Christ. So, don't beat yourself up when you, when you have a little stumble. Get back up. Get back in. Let God love you. Don't beat yourself up. Don't go sit on the sideline. Get back in the game. Admit your mistakes. Admit where you went wrong. And then grow out of it. Learn from them. And, and let God grow you out of them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we have we have uh, repentance. We have uh, we have repentance. Then we have uh, uh, see, I'm getting uh, we repentance. And then we have justification. Then we have rebirth. Then we got to learn the next one is communion. Communion. Oh, I like this one. In Christ, we began to discern the voice of God who has been speaking to us all along. We, 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 we began to discern the voice of God. He said, my sheep shall know my voice. Our awareness of the power of the Holy Spirit and acting in it and through, uh, through, and through us Seal our salvation. When we began, you know, I, you know, I get so excited about this because there's a scripture when they talk about grieve not the Holy Spirit. See, see, some people think this is about shouting. It's about living. 
We grieve the Holy Spirit more every day when God is, when we are not discerning the voice of God or not living out what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. We, 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 dis, we, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we go back to those old ways for a minute. But when we, when you begin to discern the voice of God and let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you and you submit and cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Then your testimony becomes more real. See, I, and then we become aware of the power, not our of our own, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we become assured of our salvation in God because we're beginning to commune with God, having that relationship with God. We begin to take into consideration the price that He paid for us that we fellowship with him in his suffering that we may reign with him with him in his resurrection we always the cross is always in our mind when we commune with god see then we can begin to live in the in in psalms 139 psalms 139 is is, is one of my favorite scriptures because once we begin to commune with God and we begin to understand the gifts of God that he has given us and our ministry expands outward, that means we begin to test, have a, a platform to testify about God's goodness and we're in a position to help others develop and grow. We're in a position that, that our, our testimony is on a firm and sure foundation. And we begin to tell other people about the goodness of God and help others grow and develop. But we have to develop ourselves. That transformation must be taken, must be active and alive in our life before we can help somebody else. You can't give somebody else what you don't have. So you have to, sometimes you got to live in Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24, where it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked or grievous ways in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Woo! See, we always want God to search everybody else. There are times that we must take ourselves to God, not my brother, not my sister, not my mother, not my father. It's me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Oh man, that's awesome right there. That's, that's communing with God. That, that's, that, that's being one with God that you want to be so in tune with God that you want Him to always, your heart, fill your heart because out of the depths of the heart, the mouth speaks. Am I talking to anybody out there that you want God to know your heart and know that it's pure? We're talking about communing with God is more than just what most churches do on first Sunday. Woo! Communing with God is more than what churches do on first Sunday. Y'all got to get that because it's the first Sunday of each month when we bring out the trays and we have communion with God. But we have made that such a tradition and ritual that we're losing sight of the, the value uh, uh, and the spirituality that comes with that. He didn't say you do it every first Sunday. He says, often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. But we, we got to have that heart of God that when we come on first Sunday, because I'm a firm believer that. That, that when you do communion, you still need to warn people that if you eat and drink unworthily, you eat and drink damnation upon yourself. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, why are you eating of his body and drinking of his flesh? Because you're not in that covenant relationship with him. So you're not communing with God because you have not received him as your Lord and Savior. And if you, and if you sit there in church and you call yourself a Christian, but yet you still digging ditches and backbiting and causing strife, you're not communing with God because your heart is not in tune with God. So communing with God is much more than just what we do on first Sunday because we have turned that into a ritual and not the spiritual moment that it needs to be. Now I might catch some flack for some pastors and preachers, but that's okay. 
This is what God given me, and I'm going to give it with boldness. We got to get back to the spiritual aspect of life. Listen, in John 14 and 23, Jesus answered and said to me, said unto him, John 14 and 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone love me, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He said, if any man loves me, he will keep my word. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, feed my sheep. See, we, that's where we got to get. We got to get back to keeping the word of God. When, he's, when it talks about love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, and thy soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, 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 I can stay right there. That forgiveness thing. And we, we wonder why that we only feel God on Sunday because he have not took a bold, took up a bold in our life. Do you know what a bold mean? That means he reside. He's not a visitor. He have, he have took up residence. <laughs> he has, he has, he has made it. He, it said he will come to him and make our abode with him. I want God to reside. Uh, all right. It, it did whatever it's going to do. But communion, this is, it's important to spend a lot of time in communion with God, with, with God. This is how the love of Christ is developed in us. Now listen. Now I've talked about repentance. I've talked about justification. I've talked about rebirth. I've talked about communion. So now I want to get to the the, the last thing I'm going to talk about is salvation. Salvation. See, somebody should say, "Well, salvation should have been first. No, salvation. See, that's where we get to get it all wrong. If you have not repented, if you're not, if you're not a re, have repented of anything, then then biblically you're not saved. Biblically, and I'm not judging anybody. We have to confess, confess the Lord Jesus, that God raised Him from the dead. And when you're confessing the Lord Jesus, you're confessing that. He died for your sins. He forgave you of your sins. And God raised him from the dead. And you believe in the fact that, that your sins are forgiven because you've repented. You, 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 you know about the justification. You're justified to walk in the newness of God. You, you, you've been born again. You, you had that rebirth and you're communing with God. Now you are able to embrace the salvation of God. See, you got to put all uh, salvation in one sense is all these stages put together. It's all it's also that moment when we finally receive the gift of eternal life. This may sound like a strange thing to say, but receiving the gift of eternal life can and should happen can, should happen before we die. You right, uh, brother gets com communion and communication. It's so important. Now, and listen, in communication, I'm glad you put that there. I, I, I'm, I'm stick with salvation a minute. But communication with God is not just me all the time telling God what I want him to know because he already know everything. It's me spending time letting God speak into my life. Letting the word of God speak to me. Letting the Holy Spirit do his work in me. That communication is a two-way street. I don't just always run to God and tell him what I want him to hear, but I take time to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Have an ear. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I'm the church. See, we don't spend that time hearing God, listening for God, discerning the voice of God, Letting the Holy Spirit lead us. We're too busy telling God all about our troubles. 
Listen, but in salvation, in salvation, Paul speaks of salvation uh, about it in the present tense. Salvation is present and future. But here Paul speaks in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 21. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 21. It, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable, incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. So what is that saying? Christ have mentioned your name in heaven. It says it there, for above all rule, authority, and power, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So there's some more names that God, that Christ's going to mention in heaven. You know, I'm glad my name is mentioned in heaven. Because, and we have to open our eyes to the fact. We have to open our eyes of our heart to be enlightened that, that, that we have a hope. That which not dis will not disappoint us. We have a glorious inheritance that will not spoil or fade. Uh, we have imp incomparable great power uh, to live this life, both live life and live it godly in the earth land. We have the power to be holy because Christ is because He is holy. We have that power. Why we have an in intercessor sitting at the right hand of God right now making intercessions for us. When we are saved, something amazing happened. The world literally changes before our eyes. Jesus called it having eyes to see. Many of us experience this awakening after prolonged periods of silent communion with God. A, di a vivid display of divine love and light opens up to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone in his Christ, he's a new creation. Old have passed away. Behold, behold, all has come new. Isn't that great? Isn't that great about it? Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36 and 26. And he said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and get the heart of stone from flesh from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. See, I'm glad that God changed that cold, selfish, manipulative heart and gave me a heart of caring that I care for other people, that I, I care about God. I care about the concerns that God has. I care about the kingdom of God. I, I want to, I'm mindful and always, always careful as I go through this life that I am being the best ambassador of, of God that I can possibly be. Why? Because Christ paid such a dear price for my salvation. Christ paid such a dear price for my salvation. And see, and when we get a glimpse of the life that Christ, that God has for us through Christ Jesus, we we know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, we begin to see things differently. We begin to see the flowers and nature differently. We begin to look at the ocean differently. We, uh, we begin to see this world differently when we are saved and been renewed and transformed into the image of God. We begin to see things differently. See, we sense that the kingdom is at hand. We, we all, every day I wake up, I know the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom, only thing I have is each day, each moment, 
And I, I have to live like the kingdom of God is at hand. I got to be about my father's business. I, I got to witness and testify to as many people about the goodness of God, about his saving grace. Why? Because, why? because that's part of my transformation. That's part of my transformation of becoming more like him. I got to live each day like the kingdom of God is at hand. It's always been right there. We will continue to have the experiences Jesus called entering the kingdom from now into all eternity. That's your saving grace. See, and I'm wrapping this up. The five stages of transformation uh, presented here seem to flow quite naturally. First, you turn toward God. And there's a dramatic shift in the way we think and feel. We come to understand we are both forgiven and deeply loved. So we feel better about ourselves. And as a sense of identity, a sense of identity emerges. The identity with Christ. Realizing that we are part of the larger body of Christ. I, I'm, just a, I'm just a part of the larger body of Christ. Because Christ have called others. And I don't have to be jealous of the other people that Christ have called. Because he have a special plan for me to fit in the body of Christ. That's part of that transformation that we grow up, we mature. We, we discern God's presence in and around us. We hear God's voice as we enter the eternal kingdom. And this process is what Christians generally refer to as liberation of salvation. It all sounds rather orderly. So I want to be clear in saying that spiritual growth is not orderly. Spiritual growth is not orderly. Fortunately for us, this isn't a problem. There's no shame in repeating steps, even when finding yourselves back at the beginning. See, sometimes we have to repeat. But but this transformation process, sometimes it becomes a problem because we have not learned to die completely to flesh. Self, self rises. Uh, there was a, I, I was saying I caught, I copied from somebody back in my preaching days and, uh, uh, one of my sons of the church, Tyson Tracy, he used to love for when I say that in my preaching, that sometimes we have to ask God to sit on us. Don't let me talk. Don't let me move. Don't let me do anything crazy. Just sit on me. God, hold me. Help me hold my peace. See, sometimes this, this transformation, it, this growth is not orderly. Sometimes I make two steps back, but God never steps back. He's always right there waiting on me to come back. So sometimes we find ourselves back in a position, but don't stop pushing. Don't stop pressing. Uh, 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 you got to pre continue to press toward the mark of the high calling. Remember, the race is not given to the swift, but it's the one that will endure to the end. It just... You know, even when we go through uh, different phases of transformation, it just means God is taking us deeper into the truth. It, it, and that that's a good thing because it's the nature of the journey. God wants us to grow deep. He wants to give us the meat of the word that we don't just continue to live, uh, uh, just live off milk. He wants us to grow, grow some t tough skin that when people talk about us, they're really talking about the Christ in us. Okay, I'm wrapping it up, really. Five stages of transformation on this Christ journey. Repentance. Justification. Rebirth. Communing. And salvation. Listen. We got to be mindful of those of those things. Luke, Luke chapter six, Luke chapter six, verse forty three through forty five. This is my final point. We got to be mindful of this. Luke says, "For no one, for no good tree, for no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit." For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from the thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, the good person out of the good treasures of his heart 
produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, that sums it up. In our transformation, in our growth, what kind of fruit? What kind of fruit are you bearing? You know, me and my wife always talk about we're fruit inspectors. So what kind of fruit are you bearing? And then that's the reason when you're bearing the right fruit, you won't run around hollering about people can't judge you. They're not judging you. They're merely looking at your fruit. You say you're an apple tree, but you're growing pears. You say you're a child of God, but yet you're still gossiping, creating strife and division in the body of Christ. What kind of fruit are, are you bearing? Are you love, peace, long-suffering, joyfulness? Are you bearing the right fruit? The right fruit? Because out of the depths of your heart, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. So people will know if you're following Christ by the way you talk. Woo! My mama used to tell me, uh, this is what she used to say to me when I come to her and say something stupid. She said, boy, I would have never known you were that foolish until you opened your mouth. So, a lot of people ah, wouldn't know who you really are until until you open your mouth. That's what, that's what my mama was saying. She said, boy, I, I never thought I would raise somebody that foolish until you open your mouth. What are we saying? What are we representing? Are we showing people that we have been transformed? Go back to our base scripture. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, all that God has done for us, all that he has saw you through, all that you have survived, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Commit yourself to God and do not be conformed to this world, but transform by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the will of God that we give ourselves. We transform, have a renewed mind, become more kingdom-minded. Show the influence of God on our lives by the way we live. That's all I have. Five stages. Five stages of transformation on this Christ journey. I, I, I pray that you've enjoyed the study. Thank you for tuning in. Please share it. Uh, thank you for all your comments, even though it's hard for me to read them all. But I go back and I look at them. But thank you for being with us. Continue to pray for Devoted to Him ministry. It's our desire to create disciples. We're not here to bash or talk against anything uh, or anybody or any church because we believe in corporate worship. We have an awesome pastor of Dr. M. Keith McDaniel at Macedonia. Uh, Missionary Baptist Church here in Spartanburg. So we believe in co corporate worship. We know how to submit to the authority of the house. Uh, but I, 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 but God have laid on my heart to just step out of uh, pastoring and just teach. Teach about becoming disciples. Teach about growing and maturing in God. That when you go to your corporate worship, you go to your house of worship, you will make your pastor's job even easier. Why? Because disciples will come in the house and not so many babies. Now, we always want babies in the house, but there ought to be some mature people in the house to help nurture those babies to come in and not just the pastor. Ooh, I said a mouthful there. Well, let's pray. Then I'm going to let you go. Father, we thank you today. Again, God, thank you, God. I am so humble, so grateful, so mindful of your love. God, you didn't have to do it, God, but you love me. You love me when I didn't even love myself. God, and you kept me and shaped me and molded me. In. Huh. You did some awesome things in my life. Not only my life, but those that are listening, God. Every day, I'm reminded of something that you saw me through. 
I'm reminded of your grace and mercy. I'm reminded of the debt I owe, God, even though I can't pay you back. But I want to live a way. I want to talk a way. I want to love a way to bring glory to your name. God, I honor you with the submission of our life to your will, your way, and your word. God, I pray that we, we all grow. We all grow together to become those disciples that you have called us to be. God, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We are praying, God, that you will send more laborers to the harvest, God. We need you, God. We live in a world that there need to be some strong men and women that will tell a dying world that the wages of sin is still death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We still have a testimony to give about your saving grace. Help us to be mindful of that each and every day. Help us to guard our hearts that our mouth will speak the oracles of you. David said, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is our prayer. This is our desire. For it's in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you again for tuning in. See you next week. Love you. And thank you can't do nothing about it. Love you with the love of Jesus. Have a good evening. Bye now.